Hi everyone, my name is Becky Robinson and I'm so thrilled to be joining you today with Katherine Heath and Mary Davis Holt of Flynn Heath Holtz and I'll be introducing them in just a few minutes but before I do that I want to get to know all of you and I also want you to get to know our technology. So what I would invite you to do right now is to find the question panel and we would love to know where you're calling in from today. We're also especially curious um, if any of you are calling in as a group because I know quite often people within organizations will gather in a room to listen to our webinars and learn from our experts. And so if you are calling in from an organization today, we'd love to give you a shout out. So take a moment, find your question panel. And uh, like I said, if you're calling in from an organization, we'd like to know that. Um, just in case you're curious, Catherine is calling in today from Charlotte, North Carolina. And Mary Davis Holt is in Washington, DC. And I'm here in our home office in Lansing. Lambertville, Michigan. So wow, you guys are uh, typing so fast. It looks like we have Milwaukee, we have Grand Rapids, Michigan, and someone else in Michigan, Oregon, Georgia, Miami, California, uh, Pennsylvania, Chicago, Madison, Minneapolis, Texas, um, Louisiana, looks like almost every single state. Uh, Nikki is at the SVA Certified Public Accountants. We have a caller from England, Oregon, New York, Missouri, uh, we have a group from uh, uh, oh, Boise, a company called Conduent, I hope I'm saying that correctly, um, Kreischer Miller in Pennsylvania, Atlanta, St. Louis, New York, Germany, um, wow, and there's a group from AIG Europe Limited in the UK, um, several dynamic leaders in Utah, so um, wow, AIG, AIG in Jersey City, um, somebody in Gilbert, Arizona wants to give a shout out to Grand Rapids, Michigan, so I can't, um, I can't <laughs> not do that. Uh, looks like there's a group from Kimley Horn in the Denver office. Um, a large group of women from AIG and AON in New York City. Um, so this is absolutely tremendous. A group from the William Vaughn Company in Maumee, Ohio. That's actually my, my company's accounting firm. Um, so welcome to all of those and AIG in San Francisco. So wow. And you all found the question panel, which is great because throughout today's broadcast, we're going to be inviting you to join in conversation. And we very much want to hear your opinions on these important topics related to women's leadership. So thank you for your engagement so far. And we'll be asking several more questions throughout the event. As we dig in, we want to let you know about a few other important considerations. One is that we are recording this event, and so in the event that others in your organization or friends in other organizations could learn from this session, we want you to feel free to share the recording. We also will send you a PDF of today's slides, so you, those will be available. And if you would like to live tweet today or share your thoughts on social media, we would invite you to do so using the hashtag TheInfluenceEffect. The Influence Effect is the title of Catherine and Mary's new book, which is going to release next week, and we'll talk more about that later. I also want to let you know that toward the end of the session, we are going to open for your questions, and so we would invite you to share those as you think of them, and we would want you to stay until the very end of today's session because we will have a very special giveaway, um, and you have to stay until the end to hear about it. So I think I've covered all that setup, although if, if you have any other questions, please uh, let me know about those in the panel. And before we dive in, I just want to quickly introduce our guests today, authors Catherine Heath, PhD, and Mary Davis Holt. Both of them are consultants at Flynn Heath Holt Leadership. Catherine is a founding partner, and she specializes in developing leadership programs, coaching executives, and designing training. Mary Davis Holt um, is also a consultant with Flynn Heath Holt after a 30-year career at Time Warner Cable. Yes, cable, or you don't put the cable on the end, just Time Warner. Time Warner. Time Warner. And Catherine's career was in the banking field, and she worked um, as a senior vice president and director at, of the First University at the nation's fourth largest bank, which is, was First Union and is now Wells Fargo. So these ladies have definitely um, been in the trenches as it relates to being at the executive level in top organizations. And we have so much to learn, not only from their past experiences, but also from their new research which has been explained in their latest book, The Influence Effect. So Catherine, Mary, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We're excited to be here. And um, Catherine and I both say hello to all you folks, women out there that we know so well, and men too, and for everybody new joining us. It's great to have so many on the line. We're excited. 
Thanks so much. So as we begin, um, we want to actually start by polling all of you on the call about the topic of office politics. And we would love to know what's your reaction when you hear that phrase, office politics? What comes to mind? And if you could find your question panel and put your thoughts in, how do you feel when you think about office politics? Oh, wow. OK, so Valerie cringes. Negativity, drama, hard work, hate it. A necessary evil, ugly, negative, so much drama, cringing, uh, the need to schmooze, it's avoidable, unavoidable, annoying, a distraction, yuck, stressful, red tape, clicks, um, hate office politics, let's just support each other. Oh my goodness, your thoughts, uh, obviously you have a lot of strong feelings about this, um, undermining, um, ulterior motives, lack of transparency and authenticity. Um, there's absolutely no positive connotation. It's all about game playing. Um, it's exhausting. It's hard to know how to play well. It's unfair. It's frustrating. It slows work down. Blockers to relevant work. Um, I could keep reading for a long time, ladies. Um, but I want to <laughs> hear your reactions to this. And I think we're ready. Yeah, thanks. Your responses we're very familiar with, and uh, that's why we wrote this book. In Break Your Own Rules, our first book, we positioned six rules, an old way of thinking and, and uh, a reframe, a new way of thinking. And rule number six was the old was, well, if I just work harder, I'll get where I want to go. And the new rule was be politically savvy. And as we went around speaking to thousands of women, at the very end of the keynote, we'd have them either through polling or raising of hands, which of the six rules would be the hardest for you to break? And without fail, it was always rule number six. We also had some men in the audience, and then we'd ask them to raise their hands, and what did they say? And they said the same thing, rule number six. So we found it very interesting, and that we put it there because we know that it's a it's everything you just said has a really slimy, negative, nasty feeling to it, and so we did put it down as as a, a rule. And then through our coaching, and Catherine knows this too, often we get down to the nitty gritty of what do, what do you need to do to sort of lift yourself up, and it turns out a lot of it is being savvy. Uh, learning how to navigate your firm, understanding the culture, understanding how it really works behind the curtain, the unwritten rules as well as the uh, written rules. So our whole group, and there are four of us who've written this book, we continue to talk about what could we do? How could we support women? How can we unravel this thorny, thorny issue? Because we know your women, you women are great at this, right? If you want to be politically savvy and have something happen for your child, a school, a teacher, something you want, you are as politically savvy as you need to be. So it isn't that you don't know how to do it. It doesn't feel good in the workplace. We think we shouldn't have to. All the things, waste of time, cringing, not something we're comfortable doing. And it is pervasive. And so we know that there really is um, that it's an issue for everybody out there. So if you remember, if you've read Break Your Own Rules, which was our first book, we taught the woman in red, and I wore my new red jacket for you all today, and I did buy a new red suit, which you might think is crazy, but I actually love it. Um, the woman in red on the slide, um, she represents our red suit vision, which is from Break Your Own Rules. And that vision was to see 30% women in all leadership positions globally, and I've now added it in every career path that you might have, in every corporation, medicine, law, we want to see women in leadership. Um, we visualized women in red and men in gray suits, and we took you to a boardroom. So I have good news to announce today. We're almost at 30% in a boardroom. We have done it. It's 29.7%. So we're there. So I want to take you now, since we we did that one, yay, amazing, I want to take you to a leadership table at a Fortune 500 corporation. Let's go there. How many women in red do you think you would see? Well, it would be one and a half, so we have to say one, and we need to triple that number or at least double that number to get to three. So we're still in pursuit of supporting women 
letting, wanting to see them have the career dreams, the lives that they want. So we feel like this tough, difficult, distasteful topic is one we really needed to delve into and see how we could support you in a different way. And we think the book does that. Well, and Catherine, I know that you conducted quite a bit of research as it uh, led to the development of this new book, The Influence Effect. So can you tell us about it and what you learned? Specifically, I'm really curious if there were any big surprises from your new research. There were lots of surprises for me. So what we did, because Mary was right, we were trying to figure out what's going on. How can we help them with this? So we wanted to delve into it and figure out why this was so hard for people. So we surveyed 134 people, men and women, about this, office politics, and then we did 44 interviews. And we found some things I thought were really surprising. One is that men and women have a different definition of what office politics is. Men come at it at a much more competitive, transactional definition of office politics, and women thought of it as more about collaboration. So in the beginning, we come at it differently. Both men and women, this was surprising to me, even men said this, the problem that women have, because what Mary talks about, that there's no access at the top, there are no women at the top to help other women be politically savvy, that that was a real handicap. And I was surprised that men owned up to that and said they knew that was an issue. The other, I mean, there's so many surprises here. Another thing that surprised me is that both men and women said that men were better at office politics. And women said that. They said they're better than we are. And men said, yeah, we are better than them. And they need to learn it, which was interesting. And they should learn it, which I thought was fascinating. So again, we're seeing some real differences in how men and women come at this. Another thing that surprised me, and this one was really a shocker, was that if women engaged in office politics and any kind of maneuvering and they didn't do well, they got what I call double time out. And men admitted that and said if there's no grace or forgiveness for women if they engage in this and it doesn't go well. Men, it's much easier. So I was surprised by that. I thought that was fascinating. And there's so many uh, double binds that women have, and this is yet another one where we would get in timeout for a longer, in the penalty box for longer than men do. So those are just some of the highlights, Becky, of what we, th we thought and what we learned, which many surprises in my book. Thank you, Catherine. So Mary, I'm very curious to hear what your new take is on this old topic that's that's aimed at women. And I know that you have a, a special analogy that you like to use related to the suit again, and so I would love to have you share that with our attendees. Absolutely. Well, first of all, for all of you listening, the bad news is you got to learn how to do this. It isn't optional at a certain point in your career. You've got to know how to navigate your culture. And that means, first of all, certainly being observant and seeing how it works. And then you choose how you want to navigate. How do you want to do it? So since it's so important, and we know from our coaching, we know from Rule 6, and now we know from the research that it is as a big a conundrum as we've ever faced, we were fueled to go ahead and, and write this book and try to offer some new ideas to you. We do want you to be authentic in doing this. We don't, we're offering our way, not the male way. And as we know, corporate America is still run by men. We are not calling the power shots yet. So it is, if you will, their game and we got to play, play it the way we want to play it. So that's what the book is going to offer you. And I, I use it as, um, if I had a big, big, gigantic meeting and I want to look my absolute best and I go to a men's store and I buy a, a black men's man suit, no tailoring, just buy it. How do you think I would look and feel? And having done this, with, we just did this uh, with a group of women, um, uncomfortable, I said fat, um, awkward, 
don't want to be there, embarrassed, uh, feeling uh, with uh, no power, right? No power. So then I go to my, one of my favorite designers. Let's go to a really expensive one like Armani. I go in there and buy a beautiful black suit. I have it tailored perfectly. And how do I feel? I feel powerful, appropriate, dressed as I should be. It even gives me confidence to know that I've taken that effort. Um, so it puts me in a whole different place. And that's what we're offering as we um, put this book and this idea forward that put on, put, let's put our own suit on. Let's not put their suit on. Let's be authentic. Let's do it in a way in which we are comfortable. And that's what Catherine and I are going to talk about as we have time during the, the next minutes to talk through what we're really offering you. But I know Becky wants to uh, do a little poll here. I do. So um, we would love, as we move to the next slide, to get your opinion on this word influential. So we asked before, how do you feel when we say office politics? How do you feel when you hear the word influential? What type of images or emotions or thoughts um, do you have? And I see some answers starting to come in. Power, I see at least three times. Powerful, positive, respected, strong, charisma, strength. Um, freedom, important, someone you look up to, I want that, inspiring, authority, impacting change, positive relationship, fulfilling, persuasive, confident, respected, trusted business partner, valuable, able to get things done, making a difference, successful, um, moving others forward without ugliness, persuasive, getting others involved and in getting the work done, accomplished, progress moving forward. Those are some really powerful words and phrases. And I think I saw powerful more than anything else. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this uh, transition. And Mary, could you define for us what, what this means from political to influential? Absolutely. So what's wrong with all those words? They're fabulous words. Forget <sighs> the words you had at the beginning. Ooky, slimy, sleazy, manipulative, all those nasty words we had at the beginning. And let's let's put on a new, let's put a new pair of glasses on with new lenses. Let's get 2020 on this for us. So there's nothing wrong with being an influencer. And that's what we're that's the un, the unpacking and the unthreading that we have done for you. Strategies, tactics to get your agenda to influence your agenda. So what's your agenda? Well, it could be you want a new job. That's your personal agenda. What's wrong with that? Nothing. What if it's a new idea for the organization? You want, you have to be influential in order to get that uh, uh, idea to be accepted. Or maybe it's some gigantic change for your, maybe you are aiming high, thinking big, and it's some big change for your organization. You have to learn how to be influential. The world just doesn't say, oh, I really want that job. Give it to me. And it's not just about your fine work. I, I, you know, those are table stakes. I'm assuming you've uh, paid your dues. You should be at the table. Now, how, do you, how are you the one to get chosen? And some of this is about being influential to get your agenda across. So that is the basis uh, upon which we have written the book. And we've already been out sort of previewing this. And so far, our women have really um, liked it. It feels doable. Uh, we're going, in a minute, we're going to talk through the strategies that we suggest. So things you can really do, not just talking about be influential and good luck. We have some ideas for you. And Catherine and I are going to share our big five strategies. So we've got that coming up in a second. So before we do that, we want to pause and ask those of you who are listening and engaging with us today, what holds you back from being that influencer that you'd like to be in the workplace? We'd love to hear those thoughts um, before we get to the big five. Um, so the question is, what holds you back? I see fear, fear of failure, insecurity, uh, women above, uncertainty, lack of sponsorship, uh, the old guard of men shooting down every idea we have, uh, distance, bias, lack of confidence, uh, being shut down, not being taken seriously, uh, lack of support, people who don't believe in you, uh, government politics, lack of access, having been burned before, men taking credit for my ideas, uh, 
misconceptions, fear of looking stupid, um, the chains of management that you have to report through. So lots of thoughts about, um, about those limits, misunderstanding. Um, so what, what do you two think? What holds us back? Kathy, I've been talking. Why don't you go? We're coaches. I mean, we also did research, but we're coaches. And what we hear from women, and we think it's really important that women step back because we all have a story in our head that we tell ourselves about why we don't do something. And we want you to be influential, but there might be something in your head that's holding you back. And you've got to identify that because as long as I've been a coach, I realize that people don't change unless they figure that out. What, what's keeping me? What's the belief that's holding me back? And it's a story we tell ourselves in our head. Like I have a very elaborate story I tell myself about why I don't work out more. It's really as rationalized. It's it's really a good story. I believe it, and it keeps me from working out. So if I'm going to ever change that, I have to change that story. So we want you to change the story you have in your head about being influential, and do what Mary says: put a new set of lenses on and think about this differently. We heard from women that they think that doing this, being politically savvy, and we're now trying to sell you on being more influential, is manipulative, and they have a story about that. And we would never tell you to do something that violates your integrity. I, I don't do that. I just want you to think about it differently and think about it as a way, if you care deeply about something, don't you want to influence it? Mary, what would you add? Well, I think what we're trying to do here is, is quiet those limiting belief voices in your head. The person that says, well, you'll look stupid if you go see this CEO and talk about your big idea. Who do you think you are to go off and do that? We have loud voices in our heads telling us not to do it. So that already puts a negative, you know, I'm going to fail at this because my inner voice is already telling me I can't do it. So what we want to do is, is, is quiet those limiting beliefs. Um, in your head so that you'll try to do some of these things because I think if you start off thinking I'm never going to pull this off well we won't and I, we also find in our coaching we women are pretty black and white if we can't have it the way we want it we don't really want to do it so if I don't like being politically savvy I just won't do it uh, if I'm not going to be great at it well then I'll just leave that aside you know I don't really need to do it and that's also another story you tell yourself, which isn't true. You do have to learn how to do it. And I think one of the things Catherine and I often hear, it's very, it's, listen, we all feel this way. Who has the time for all this? Mm -hmm. Who wants to talk to this person and that person and get to know this one and, you know, I need to circle back. It does take some time, but at this point in your career, this is where you should be spending your time, which is making sure what's important important to you. You get you have a vote here. What's important to you can actually be realized. You can actually get your idea, your strategy, your new job, that you can get that to happen. So the limiting beliefs are pretty powerful in all of our lives. The stories you tell, the gremlins, that little voice in your head, whatever you want to call that thing that talks to you so powerfully. Uh, we'd like you to lower the volume, probably won't go away entirely, lower the volume and be open to trying some things we're going to talk about in a minute. And what I would right. just say today, think about what it is that's holding you back. What we know about leaders is reflection is important. So think, Ralph, you've got time, you're here, what is holding me back? And create a new story for yourself. I love that. Thank you, Catherine. Well, I'm excited to dig into these big five strategies. Um, and I would love to hear what you offer women in the book in terms of how to be influential. What are you recommending? We came up with the big five, and you can see those are the big five animals you're supposed to see in Africa. Uh, we, the big five strategies that we think will really help you. And this is only in our webinar, you're going to have to read the book, but we're going to give you an overview and talk about a couple of ways you can do it, but there's a lot in the book about it, and this is where we get very, very practical. This is actually, these are actually things you can do. The first two um, were my chapters, and so I get to do those first. Uh, the power of the informal, and I'm a big believer in building relationships. The power of the informal is going another level. It's 
not just talking about business and what's going on in the office with people within your organization. It's going to a deeper level, really getting to know people because you get sponsored not only from your fine works and your visibility, but also getting to know people more deeply. What's she really like? What does she really care about? What's important to her? And really getting to know people. That's when people, you know, you have the opportunity to go back and forth and do favors for each other and help each other and sponsor each other because you know someone on more than a superficial level. Now, when can you do this? The easy ways to do it are what you already have at your fingertips. One is come to the meeting early, stay later. Chat with people. You know, I just went to New York and I just saw Hamilton. I don't know. Talk about things going on in your life. Share something your kids did. Vacation, Thanksgiving. There are a million things you can talk about. But go into a little more, and I know we call it chit-chat or socializing and, you know, who has time for that. No. In the book, we call it meaningful, meaningless time. It's so important. Now, let's talk about our relationships, whether with uh, a girlfriend or a boyfriend, somebody who's our good friend. What do we do? When do we really get deep with them? When we're sitting around really talking about something important. Could be riding in the car, could be over a glass of wine, could be in numerous ways. That's when we build the relationship with the person, when we get really serious about what matters to each other. Use those relationship skills you have. So before the meeting, after the meeting, uh, over coffee. Let's say you go to a company function. You got to be there. Don't go talk to the people you know. Go talk to the people you don't know. You may have seating arrangements. Suddenly you're sitting by someone you don't know. Use that time to get to know each other. Really take the time to be known to get to know each other uh, on a deeper level. And I'll just give you a quick story that just happened to me. I've just gone on a new board. I was at the opening dinner of my new board and all new people and they sat me by a very important player in the organization and I sit on that board. And it just so, ha well, he delightful, wonderful man and we were sitting next to each other and we started, we didn't talk business, we started sharing our lives, you know, how our families, children, wives, the whole thing. And before we even got the first course, we got deep. And I will tell you, by the end of dinner, we had bonded. And we have a special bond right now, and it took dinner. Because we got on a topic that was important to him, and it was important to me. Now, I'm not saying you have to get intimate and share intimate deep. happened that we did, but you don't have to do that. But if you've got to take it to the next level of relationship building, where you really, because that's where it happens, in that informal moment, informal moment when somebody really gets to know you. And I have found that my entire career and even more so now, because that's what really bonds you to the person. Relation, okay, I'm gonna move on to relationship mapping. Becky's sort of shaking her hand. I'm probably talking too much. Um, no, it's good. I'm just thinking about how trust is, is built in those informal moments. Absolutely, Abs and that's what it really is about. You know, are you gonna support somebody for a big job if you don't even really know them? You've got to get to know them. Um, the relationship map, here's, here's the deal with your relationship map, and I did this in my head. What we're suggesting is that you actually write down all the players and the influencers, whether it's you trying to get a new job or get an idea across. I like to use the organizational chart and actually say, okay, who on that chart, who's the real power player, who's the real decision maker, how many people weigh in, who knows me really well? Who doesn't? Who would support me? Who wouldn't? I don't go actually ask them, would you support this, me and this job? But you know where they would come out because you have that, that power. The informal has happened before and you know them really well. Well, I was going for a really, really big job at my career at Time Incorporated in magazines. And I had that chart in my head. And frankly, I missed two important players who knew me, but I had not done my homework. And a, series of events occurred and because of those two people I, I did not get the job and that's my fault if I don't know if it would have changed or not had I done my homework but let me tell you the act of writing it down do whatever you want an orc chart a spoken wheel um, however you want to map it out with a pencil or on, on 
uh, you know, program, do it. And really look at how am I going to really make this happen? And then you know where your homework is. Don't spend time on, time on somebody who already loves you, accepts you, would love to see you in a job. Go see those two people I didn't go see. And talk about your aspirations. Let them know you want to be on the list and how important this is to you and why this is your ideal job. So the relationship map is just a really practical way to go about assessing have I done my homework or not. And if you have, okay, you can rest easy that you've done everything you can, let the cards fall where they may. If you haven't, then go do what needs to be done. So those are two, we think, very practical ways to approach being an influencer and getting to the right people. Catherine. Yes, I want to talk about two more. And these came from our interviews. The people we talked to, we said, how can we be more influential? And they said, you've got to use the power of the informal. And you've got to have think through the relationships and spend the time to do this. And if you really want to be influential, good influencers do these. They're skills. We call them strategies, but they're skills. And you know how to do them, and you can get better at them. One that we heard, the third one, the scenario thinking, was a surprise for me, but it came up a great deal. And what we hear all the time in organizations, Mary and I work in a lot of different organizations, is they want leaders who can drive change. And what people said in the interviews is, we want people who are scenario thinkers. We want people to be strategic. And when they are trying to drive change, they think of the ramifications of the change. What is the, if you drop a pebble in the pond, what are the ripples? What's going to happen? It's kind of like a chess game. And what are the four moves out? And if you're going to be influential, you have to have this kind of thinking. You just can't, somebody said to me one time, hope is not a strategy. You have got to have the time and be strategic and think about all the different scenarios, best, worst, maybe. A, a few years ago, a friend of mine took me to a WNBA game in really good seats, and we were sitting right behind the bench. And at a very crucial time, the coach called the team out, and she had one of those little whiteboards, and, and she was talking. I could, we could overhear her. They were so close. And she said to them, they were going to throw the ball in, and, and she said, okay, if they throw the ball to this person, I want you to do X. And if they throw the ball to that next person, I want you to do Y. And if they throw the ball to the third person, I want you to do Z. And they thought through, she told them every scenario that could happen and what to do. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to think through, if I'm going to drive change, what are the different things that can happen? And as Mary said earlier, it takes time. You, you have got to put pen to paper and think through these things and talk to people. In my career, one time in banking, I took what I thought was a grand proposal in to a group, and I had really worked it, and I had all my numbers and, and everything, and I did not think through a resistance that came up in the meeting. And it was my fault. I, I just hadn't thought through it. And I had to go back. It was an embarrassing and regroup, uh, painful lesson, uh, learn things the hard way, and, and always think about what are the different options. And it is X's and O's. If Mary does this, I might do this. If Becky does this, I might do this. So think through those. It's a really important skill. And you're going to say, like Mary said earlier, I don't have the time to do that. Well, as you get higher and higher in, in organizations, this is your work. It is your work to be an influencer. Catherine, I was just going to add that on scenario thinking, if you're in a big new job and you're feeling overwhelmed, why don't you think about what the best could be and what the worst could be? Because sometimes when you actually write down what the worst could be, it ain't so bad. So actually playing out the best the, maybe realistic, I don't know, and then the worst. And we we coached a woman who started in terms of her own strategy, how she, she decided to go for the moderate plan, thinking that the worst case would not happen. If she was so successful, she then moved over to the best case. So even just, not just fear, full of fear and stewing and worrying, catastrophizing, 
actually map it out and as Catherine said talk to somebody about it and you may dispel some of your fears sorry Catherine I had to interrupt well, I think that's very helpful because one of the things about this and I, I get passionate about this is that women tell me all the time that they get caught flat-footed in meetings they don't they get caught and they didn't know what to say and if you do scenario thinking you're less likely to get caught flat-footed and not know what to say all right the next one is called influence loop and I love the strategy and we first heard it from a woman that when we were interviewing her we said you know what do you do to be influential she said oh I dial for dollars what is dialing for dollars and basically what she does she said was she takes out a piece of paper and she writes down the people that she needs to poll and talk to and who she's gonna call and she said I put a PowerPoint together of a couple slides I send it to them I start down my list and I call them you know what here's what I want to do what do you think figure out what they don't like what they do like get their input and she said, then, you know, I, I roll it up. I might change the two slides a little bit and I do it. I don't call everybody back, but I might call two or three people back. And then she said, when I go in the meeting, all the resistance is dealt with. And she said, the implementation is easy because they've already liked the idea and resistance is down because they've had input. And she said, I don't get surprised. I don't get in the meeting and get surprised. And she said, you know, they all think that they had input and they're part of this wonderful thing that's getting ready to happen. And she says it's wonderful and it just takes off. And I think it's a, a woman strategy, a very female suit, as Mary talked about, where you go in and, and you work to influence, you, you work the loops, you take the time. I was coaching a woman not long ago and we were actually doing this research and she called me up and she said, that she had put a proposal in front of a group that she leads and she said it was dead on arrival. She just said, oh, she just did not anticipate the resistance she was going to get. So I said to her, you know, why don't we make a list of who it is you need to talk to? And so she made her dialing for dollars list. She called them up. She had to call a few of them back the second loop. And I'll never forget the text she sent me sailed through. And she said it took work. But she said it would have taken more work if she hadn't done it because she would have had to work it on the back end. So I think it's a real strategy that we can all use to think about who are the people and working it. The last one I love, Mary, but I want you to talk about it. It's momentum. Momentum is celebrating your small victories. Uh, maybe there's some low-hanging fruit and you're able to accomplish some things. Let's say you're, you're a change agent. You have a big idea for your, your department within the organization. And let's say you're able to accomplish a few little things. That's momentum. Celebrate those. Let that build your confidence and empowerment up. Because what you want to do is start momentum so it gets easier. It's not so difficult. The ball starts rolling. It starts gaining momentum and speed. And you're getting towards your goal much more quickly. And so often we women are so hard on ourselves. You know, we're never doing enough. We're never accomplishing enough. Oh, that little one, it doesn't count. It's not really big enough. No, tell yourself you have done something and you are good because you need to keep your confidence up and your conviction and your intention and you want other people to know hey look two or three things have happened I know they're small but it's all going in the right direction and I'm gonna keep moving so some of it is about staying positive and optimistic that you're going to be able to accomplish it and let the momentum take over because we get when we get in our zone we can do a lot of things we never thought we could do. So that's the idea of momentum because we do want you to aim this, this whole being an influencer is that you're a big influencer, that you are aiming high. You're not setting small goals, that you're going for big things. I happen to believe set stretch goals for yourself and you'll get closer than you would if you set comfortable goals for yourself. And uh, celebrating those little victories as you go along will help you with momentum. So those, uh, yeah, go ahead, Catherine. No, I would just add that, Mary, because what we heard in the interviews from people when we said what makes good influencers, they said they create momentum. They create what you're talking about. And they're intentional about it. They, they figure out what those small wins are that they've got to have, and they go for them so that they can say, look, you know, my project or whatever I'm doing is great, 
and it's taken off. And that power of the forward motion, as you said, is makes everybody say, well, I'll get on this train. And that story I told about the woman who started with her moderate case, when she realized the worst wasn't going to happen, she had tons of victories there in that in that realistic mode before she went for before she went big. She had a lot of successes, and it propelled her to go big and to really try some groundbreaking things, which she did. And I think Catherine, you would agree, her accomplishment is still celebrated. Her impact is still felt. Well, I I don't know about the rest of you of you, but I have a lot of ideas already about the way these strategies could help me to build more influence. And so what I'm going to do right now is launch a poll. We would love to know from you which of these strategies could help you the most. So if you could take a moment to select one. Um, is it the power of the informal and finding those moments to get to know people informally? Or perhaps it's the relationship map and you're going to map out the various people and influencers in your organization and really work to get to know the people you don't know. Or maybe you you need to be more strategic and think about the various outcomes associated with the change you're trying to ignite. Uh, maybe you need to have influence loops where you uh, behind the scenes talk about your ideas before presenting them for a decision. Or maybe you like this idea of momentum, small wins leading to much bigger wins. Um, so I'm going to let people continue to answer. Um, about 40% of you have voted. We're going to give you a few more moments. Um, and we would love to hear of these five strategies, which one you think can help you the most in your work. Um, I don't know, I was thinking as an entrepreneur that at first I thought, well, this only applies to women who are trying to uh, go up the corporate ladder. But I know just from listening to the two of you today, I feel exceedingly inspired that there are things I want to do in the world. And so you don't have to be, you know, trying to climb the corporate ladder for the influence effect to have a powerful impact on your career. Okay, I'm going to close this poll and, and show everyone the results quickly. Um, it looks like... Um, we have a tie here between the power of the informal and scenario thinking as uh, the strategies that you believe might help you the most. But really, this is pretty sp split evenly. Ladies, what do you think? Is this what you would have expected with the results? 24% on power of the informal, 20% on relationship map, 24% on scenario thinking, 20% on influence loops, and 12% on momentum. I'm thrilled with the power of the informal because that's usually a hard sell. People say I just don't have time and I, you know, I don't think it's, you know, it should be based on the merit of my work. So I love it. Well, what we want to do now is take a few minutes and I think we have another slide. Um, and we're going to take your questions now. Um, there have been lots that have been coming in and I'll, I'll try to uh, get to as many of those as I can, uh, ladies. Um, Let's see. Um, wow, lots of questions. So um, da David says, women are underrepresented as financial advisors, an area that could be very successful and influential. He's wondering, and maybe this would be a question for you, Catherine, if there's something that can be done to attract women to financial planning services. I think there could be. I think women are really strong at relationships and it's a strength. We should all have a career that's based on our strengths and that's a, I think about my financial planner I have a relationship with and, and, and trust is a big deal. And I think that selling it to women on that, that it's a strength of ours and every career that uses the strengths is one where we usually see people do better. Thanks, that's really helpful. So we have so many comments from our previous questions that I'm having a little bit of trouble getting back to the questions people put in. So if you have a question that you put in earlier in the hour and you'd want to copy it back for me, I would love it. Um, but here's one from Catherine. So she says, as you performed your research, have you been focusing on executive levels? So men and women who succeeded at reaching uh, leadership levels, or if you're looking at multiple career phases, do you see differences and similarities in how the middle to senior level execs versus uh, senior levels versus execs are perceiving the political struggle? Does that make I, sense? Is there a difference? Yeah, yeah. Mary, jump in with this too. I mean, our research was of men and women. We interviewed and we surveyed men and women, and we interviewed men and women. We interviewed more women than we did men in the interview part. Because we were really looking for strategies that help women. That's what we're after, is that suit that Mary's talking about. 
women don't want to use male strategies. They want to use female strategies. And we needed to find those in order to help women, which is what we're after, that red suit vision that Mary talked about. And I think that as you go higher, decisions are made in what I call the white space, where it's not clear, it's ambiguous. And so we were trying to figure out you know, what's happening in that white space that we need to figure out and help women with. So we really haven't re researched the, the lower level. We were really looking at the top and trying to figure it out. But I personally, who's been coaching for a very long time, think that strategies work for anybody, for any level. But we were looking at the top. I would think at the mid-level, this would all be more intense and more difficult. Because as you, do go, as you do progress, you do learn some of these things and you do start to try some of these things. In the middle area, in the mid-range of your career, I would think it would be pretty daunting. I, I would that, but I don't know that scientifically. I know that from coaching and my own experience. Sure. So here's a great question from Ashley. She's wondering how you overcome people's expectations. So if they expect you to behave a certain way as a woman versus being an influencer and speaking up. So how do you overcome people's expectations of your behavior? Ain't that terrible? <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do. We are judged more harshly. We, it, it, it's what a man can do and what I can do without looking like I'm too aggressive. Or, and I will tell you a, just a very quick story. I'm, I've been guilty of this myself, and I've had to really do some uh, soul searching about it. Um, there was a, a peer, a woman in my career who was a natural at this. And I would say, look at her. Look what she's doing. Look, you can just see her going over there and talking to those guys. She was doing exactly the right thing. And I, now, somebody who supports women, I was being critical of her. So we're part of it too, but we are judged much more harshly. And here's what I say, do it well. Uh, you don't need to make a big deal out of it, but do it well. And I believe that as we do it in the way that we're trying to suggest you put on the women's suit, not the man's suit, Maybe we're going to look smoother, better, more nuanced, more sophisticated at doing it. But I accept what you're telling me as a truth. Catherine and I know this happens and we don't like it, but until we get a new behavior pattern up there because there are more of us women up there, we sort of have to follow those rules in order to uh, be able to get where we want to go. Not that we like it, but we have to do it. What do you think, Catherine? I would agree. Well said, Mary. So here is a great question from Wendy. How did the dynamics change when women are trying to influence men versus when women are trying to influence women? Great question. <laughs> All right, Catherine, you look like you have an answer. <laughs> oh, goodness. I think they're the same strategies. I mean, I think that you have something that you want to do that you care about and you want to influence people and you want to drive the change that you're talking about or drive your career. It might be something you want to do. I just think you need to think through what we've, we've talked about. How do I build relationships? Who are the important people? How do decisions get made? What What are the different options? And they, I, I don't think there's a huge difference. It's about that first part that Mary talked about, building the relationship. As Becky, you said, when you, people trust you, that then you can work together and collaborate. Mm -hmm. I would just say in that story I told you where I didn't get the job that all the women on my relationship map were deep friends and already supporting me. So I didn't have to work as hard at convincing them. Now that's a different, that's not always the situation. But there's so, at the time when I was in my height of my career, there were so few of us there that uh, we banded together and we sort of had each other's backs. And we're honestly, I'm not just saying this, we were very supportive of each other. So um, I already had them on my side, so to speak. So they were a little easier to influence, but that's not always the case, I, I will admit. That's helpful. Um, so we have a question from a woman who mentions that her firm doesn't have any formal mentorship program for women supporting other women in leadership. And would you have any recommendations if someone wants to see that type of situation in their organization change? I think it's our responsibility to go build mentorship. I mean, go to people and seek advice, and they get enrolled in your career. And what we know, if I think back through 
the people that mentored me and sponsored me, it was a relationship. And I did work for them, I did good work for them. They thought, oh, I need to sponsor her or help her or coach her. And that's what builds the relationships. Not really, the research on formal programs is not very good. Even though we sometimes work with organizations to do them and try to be deliberate about them, and we certainly do that at our firm. The thing that you can do as a woman is go build those relationships. Because asking people about what do you think about this enrolls them in your, your career and, and they start coaching you. And I would recommend if you really do want a formal program, for go, go to leanin.org. Do www.leanin.org. They have uh, Lean In Circles, which is a form of the mentoring. And it's all, as I understand, all free to you. It's go look at their, their opening page and you can get in touch with them and they'll provide you with materials and discussion topics and all kinds of things if you really want to go more formal. I think what we see though is those mentoring circles start off pretty, lots of momentum and then it does die away. So think about, um, I'm with Catherine, um, find, your, find your mentoring your group of mentors and people that you really relate to. I would I agree with that. Sure. So Mary is wondering if you have any different advice for women who are just beginning their careers right out of college. What do they need to know about being influential? I, I would say start with that mindset that you want to be influential and take advantage of all those moments that come your way to you know, get to know somebody better or Start mapping. You know, when you first start your career, you are going to need to think about who's showing interest in my career. Maybe I should get to know them a little better. Start. start I would start because I'm a big believer in relationships. I would start there. Catherine, what do you think? I would agree. Start building relationships. Uh, be proactive about your career. You are the CEO of your career. It's a business you run. And so, what's the strategy for your business. What is it that you want to achieve? Who needs to help you? Just like you would do a, you learned in college and how to do a plan uh, and so make a plan for your career and think different scenarios. Not one plan but several different plans and spend the time managing your career because it's, it's your career and, and we all work a long time so you've got to figure out what is your strategy and what is it that you want to do. I guess also don't at the beginning of your career, you're going to be working hard. Rule number six applies to those who reach mid-career. At the beginning of your career, you're showing your work ethic, you're building your craft, your skill, um, you're meeting people, you're, you're getting known, and you're building your visibility. You're building your personal brand. And all of that's really important. But never sit back and think somebody else is going to do all this for you. Uh, as much as we'd like it and as fair as we want everything to be, uh, you've really got to put yourself out there from the very beginning and be aware of the water within which you're swimming and decide your path. And so I guess I would just say don't ever, even 21 right out of school, don't sit back and um, think, okay, it's going to happen the way I want it because you got to make it happen. That helps. Thanks, Mary. Um, Denise is wondering, what do you do um, if you have an immediate supervisor at the VP level who doesn't believe in you? Is there a way to work around that? Yes, there is. What you would do is take out that piece of paper that Mary's talking about and draw the relationship map and figure out who are other people that you can ally with and build those relationships. And I would also not suggest that I would suggest also to keep trying to talk to your supervisor but go build other relationships that might propel your career. And in that relationship remembering you're the only one you can control. So <laughs> how you want to deal with that difficult boss is your decision. And I don't want to get fatalistic here but at some point it may be a deal breaker for you and then you'll have to live up to that and, and make decisions based on that. I always say keep talking, keep trying, uh, see, see where you can find common ground. We've all had difficult bosses. It, I don't know anybody who hasn't had at least one. And you've got to learn how to be strong and courageous and brave and get through that. 
And if it reaches a point of no return, then, then that's your decision. But know that you, you're the one in charge of only of you. You probably can't change them, but I would hope you could find common ground. So um, I want to just flag that we have so many questions that it's going to be impossible to get to them all, but I want to let you know that we are having a follow-up to this webinar with another one of the authors of The Influence Effect in just a few weeks. So I'll make sure that all of you receive an invitation to that private Q&A with Diana um, Faison. Sorry, I, like her, I lost her last name for a second. And hopefully we'll be able to address some of these questions then or you know, maybe through... Um, your blog. Um, th there are so many great questions that could be addressed. So thank you to all who have taken the time to type them. Um, I want to share a question that came from our friendship, Bell, and uh, he's uh, going back to the whole red suit vision. You mentioned at the top of the call, Mary, that we have achieved almost the red suit vision as it relates to corporate boards, but as it relates to corporate positions and um, organizations, we're far, far away from that vision. Um, and he's wondering if there's anything that we can do to help move that forward or, or, or how you see us achieving that goal. You want to go first, Catherine, or what? I, I, mm -hmm. I think we have to keep plugging away. It's up to each of us individually. I do think what exists, and Catherine and I have done a couple of deep studies recently with corporations about what's going on with their culture and their women. And, you know, unconscious bias exists. It does. We were just talking about being influential that a guy can do something I might not be able to do and that's not fair and that's an unconscious bias and it is there and we need to recognize it and do what we can to change culture which is very difficult it's gonna take some time but our books and our philosophy is let's do what we can do to get ourselves there let's let's do it all and put our whole self into it to try to be one of those leaders if that's what you want to do to be one of those leaders i think we have to keep plugging away and um persevere and i do think an another i don't know catherine if it's another generation i'm not i'm not sure how long it's gonna but look what's happened with corporate boards i mean uh when we first started this work it was in the low teens so let us accept that in the years since the first Break Your Own Rules book, that number has gone up. And so hopefully the leadership in all walks of life, to your point, Becky, for anybody is going to get, um, it's going to get bigger. What do you think, Catherine? I would agree with what you're saying, Mary. And I think that we, one of the things that we see is that women need to help women and we need to help each other. Be an agent for somebody else. Talk up your friend Mary or talk up your friend Becky to other people and that helps us. That's something that we can do for each other that's in our control. I mean we can't, you, I would lo we love to change organizations. We work with organizations to change. That's one of the things Mary's talking about in the research we're doing. And in the meantime, I think we have to, as individuals, help each other and be strategic about our careers. Spend the time on it. I'll say sometimes to women, you know, what is it that you want to do? And they say, I don't know. And I, you got to think through that and figure it out because it's hard to be influential about something where you don't even know what it is that you want to do. So spend the brain cells and figure out what it is that you want to do and then go about influencing for it. Thanks. Because remember, leadership is about impact, and leadership is about build, building followership. And if you think you're a leader and you have no followers, you are not a leader. And if you're not having impact on the organization, you're just sitting in the chair. You've got the title. You're not really doing it. So we encourage you to think about influence and impact and followership. Um, as some of the messages that, that we put out all the time. And we know that you're capable of doing it. We know that. Well, let's talk a little bit about next steps. If you're still listening to this call, and so many of you are, we would love to see you pre-order your copy of The Influence Effect. It is going to be released next week, so if you need an individual copy, you can get that at Amazon, or if you need a bulk order for your organization, you can get those at 800 CEO Read. And we would also invite you to visit FlynnHeath.com so that you can subscribe to their newsletter and hear the newest research, their newest ideas, their newest tips, uh, their newest strategies, and you can stay in touch with Catherine and Mary and, and the others at the firm at Flynn Heath Holt Leadership. And I would encourage you to take that action step um, today. And I'll be back in touch um, via email later this afternoon with a link to the recording and other resources. But I know right now we want to turn it back to you, Mary and Catherine, for some parting words and inspiration for those who are still with us. 
Catherine, you want to? I'll go first. I'll let you in on that. Um, we hope this book gives you career lift. That's what we want. We want to be your support system from afar because we really want you to be one of those 30% who's going to run the world and run corporate America. We do want you to aim higher, think bigger, and claim that dream. You know, so many of us get beaten down by what's going on, what's happening. We get discouraged. We want to, you know, opt out. We want you to opt in, and we want you to opt in for all the right reasons because you're feeling empowered. And that's what this book is really, that's our, our mission. And that's the only reason we wrote these books. Uh, book publishing, Becky, is not one of the most profitable things to do, as you know. It's a tough business, and we're not out here to, we're not, uh, you know, um, John Grisham. We are trying to provide a service for you. And we want, really want this book to support you and empower you and give you confidence and courage and the ability to lower those limiting beliefs. Catherine. I would agree with Mary about the limiting beliefs. If you didn't get anything, I hope you got some strategies from today. But think about what is the story you're telling yourself about why you're not doing this. Have a little therapy session with yourself. But I want to read you uh, from the dedication of our book because this book is for you. And here's what the dedication says. To the generations of amazing women leaders who have and will change our world for the better. And that's you. We really do believe that the world would be a better place if there were more women leaders. And we want you to go out and be influential about your organizations, about your businesses, about things, change you want to achieve, changes in your career. And we want you to go do that. So this book is to you. Thank you, ladies. Yeah. Every, everyone you. have a fantastic day. I did forget to say the giveaway. Um, I have a couple of copies of Break Your Own Rules. If you will send feedback to me about today's event uh, to the email address webinars at weavinginfluence.com, we have two of these that we're going to give away. And we also have a couple of the Harvard Business Review research that Catherine and her team did on meetings and women being more effective in meetings. And we'll also select two winners for that report. So the Harvard Business Review report or the Break Your Own Rules book, the first book from these authors. If you'll email me, Becky uh, at weavinginfluence.com or webinars at weavinginfluence.com, we'll uh, select from the feedback that we receive and get those resources out. Ladies, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Becky. Thank you, Becky. Bye-bye.